This is John Cole with OKRaw.com. Today will be another exciting episode for you. In this episode, we're going to answer your guys' questions. If you guys do have a question you would like to submit uh, to me to answer, make sure you post a comment in my community tab, which is linked down below this video. I apologize. I can't answer any questions directly since I have over 1 million different followers on different social media outlets. Anyways, let's get into this month's questions. First question is from Gozo Raw. Hi, John. Here's my question for you. With warm weather here, what's your best raw vegan recipe for healthy, quote-unquote, ice cream? Thanks in anticipation. Lindsay on the tiny Mediterranean island of Gozo. Never heard of that. <laughs> I have been to Cyprus. It was really beautiful. I loved it out there. So, I mean, here's the thing. Like, ice cream, the easiest one is just 100% frozen fruit, right? Freeze the fruit vacuum seal it when you freeze a fruit to prevent the oxidation you know the ripest in-season fruit you could find near you my favorites like of course things like bananas i love to do mangoes and all the berries for sure and then put them through a either a champion juicer a norwalk or pure juicer grinder attachment or through a slow juicer or heck even just in your vitamix with the tamper or even a food processor, depending on what kitchen equipment you have. Each one of those different methods will make it a little bit different. Some will fluff it up more than others. Some will make it a bit more hard pack, and it kind of depends on what you would prefer. I kind of like to use really the pure juicer grinder, which is kind of like superior to the champion because it kind of fluffs it up, and it's also fairly easy to clean. When I'm super lazy and don't mind some extra loudness, I actually use the uh, Blendtec blender. And I have the, tw the mini twister jar, which really works for a nice single serving of the ice cream. And also, of course, is really easy to clean. I have experimented and have a dedicated ice cream maker, you know, that has a built-in, you know, refrigerant in there and will cool stuff. I mean, those are over like $100, maybe $200 or so, maybe these days. And you could buy one of those. And basically, the thing you would do with that is that you would make like a coconut or nut milk or cashews blended with your fruits and then put it in there and then it would freeze it up. Of course, the other option that's getting popular now, I have one but I have not tried, is the Ninja Creamy, where basically you could put anything in like little cups and freeze it and then you put in the creamy, put it in there and then it basically just, it, it um, grind it all up with a high speed blade and fluffs it up to give it really a texture like no other. I would encourage you guys to use something like dates, which is what I use in all my ice creams. If I remember, I'll put a link down below to my video where I actually made a vanilla ice cream using coconuts, which is my favorite fat source to make the ice cream. Although, that being said, I'm not eating a lot of coconuts these days myself. Uh, next question is from Kawaii Pansu 1693 Could you eventually make more in-depth videos about pressure cooking things to increase nutrients like carrots, beans, or maybe even salmon, just enough to kill bacteria and parasites, if that's morally acceptable to talk about. All right, so you'll never find me uh, heat processing salmon on my channel personally, although according to the published scientific studies, you know, salmon and other seafoods are the healthiest, you know, meats to eat. If you do choose to eat meats, of course, I encourage you guys to eat what the salmon eats to get your essential fats and especially things like astaxanthin, which could be all gotten from plant-based sources instead of, you know, fish and eating fish and over farming fish in the oceans. When you buy commercially raised fish, you guys might want to check out a documentary on Netflix called Sea Spiracy. Of course, if you guys do want to eat fish, I encourage you guys to, you know, raise your own fish and catch them yourself and kill them yourself, or at least just catch them yourself which some vegans may not like me saying, but I'm a realist. Um, that being said, I do have videos where I show how to cook eggplants on my gardening channel. Also a whole mixture of different vegetables on my gardening channel. Link down below to that. And I mean, basically using Instant Pot is always the same way. You know, I harvest like fresh greens from my garden. I could put it in there for zero minutes or one, two or three minutes just to get it cooked a little bit. And then I eat it. That being said, I encourage you guys also not just to get lazy and only eat Instant Pot stuff. We want to eat the majority of the food we eat should be raw. And, you know, to get in a little bit more vegetables than you otherwise normally would because they kind of break cell walls. And also you do get 
some more nutrients. Certain nutrients can increase, as shown by my video down below, where I talk about, you know, cooking can increase nutrients, not decrease them. All, in all cases, like some raw vegans may teach still, um, inaccurately based on the science, I encourage you guys to do what makes the most sense for you. You know, for me personally these days, I'd rather heat process some additional vegetables than eat extra fruit. So that way I could get more vegetables, especially some of the starchy tubers such as purple sweet potatoes, potatoes um, into me to give myself and my microbiome more importantly some resistant starch that I believe to be beneficial. Next question is from uh, Aurore Popskew1153. What would be your tips on living a highly raw diet in the temperate climate? Where I'm living, there are around five to six months of cold where almost nothing grows. We dry up a lot of fruits, do some ferments, but for the rest, is much harder to be raw. Another question is, have you ever had digestive issues with astringent persimmons? All right, so I will be the first to say I don't have any direct experience living in a climate where there's five to six months of cold weather without things growing. I have visited like Toronto for, you know, maybe up to a month at a time when I had a girlfriend that lived in, uh, you know, Stratford, Ontario. And so I lived up there with their family and I, mean, I was able to go to the grocery store and still maintain my raw diet without actually eating any heat processed foods at that time. And I have friends like Chris Kendall, you know, who you know, actually now lives in Europe where it's cold a lot of the year, he's still fine because you could always find imported fruits and vegetables. Once you start placing more restrictions on yourself, like I got to eat local <laughs> all the time, then it can get more challenging. You know, that's where I think the operand word is a highly raw diet, right? So I would encourage you guys to eat seasonally as much as possible. And then of course, buy imported fruits you know, to some extent, but also you might want to think about, you know, if it's in the winter in a cold climate, five to six months of the year, right, in the warm season, you could grow storage crops, such as sweet potatoes and other tubers, um, potatoes, different kinds of butternut squashes, spaghetti squashes, kabochi squashes, all these hard squashes will store, and then you could eat that as a percentage of your locally grown food, if, if that is one of your main goals, and then, of course, just buy whatever fruit money can buy at a local grocery store near you. Of course, if you guys want to take it to the next level, right, you guys could harvest food that, you know, from the local area, from farmers or whether you grew yourself, while you could do dehydration, probably over dehydration, I would probably recommend freezing first, actually, which is going to be quite rare. So you'd have to actually buy an extra freezer so you could freeze all your fruit and then just basically thaw them and eat them in the wintertime or basically just put them directly into smoothies and vacuum blend them um, to put them in a smoothies. Of course, beyond freezing, if you have a lot of extra money to spend, you could purchase a freeze dryer, which I hope to start making videos on again soon. I found a manufacturer of freeze dryers out of Idaho that I hope to start working with. Um, and then you could make freeze dried fruit or vegetables or anything in season and then open the bags up during the winter, rehydrate them in water and then eat them or you could just eat them without rehydrating them, but then of course you must drink lots of water because they are, um, you know, basically more dehydrated than dehydrated food because more water comes out. That being said, more nutrition is saved. That being said, the freeze drying process can take a long amount of time. The machines are quite expensive as well. So yeah, that's probably what I'd say to you, you know. Um, yeah, eat some heat processed foods, moderate that, try to buy a lot of stuff fresh and raw, whatever you could get that's imported and you know stick to the whole food plant-based and yeah do as much fresh stuff as you can maybe there's more vegetables near you do some juicing make some green smoothies yeah and freeze a lot of stuff i'd say that's probably the easiest invest in a you know a freezer to basically store all your food for the winter next question is from uh, media water flow 284 hi john i've decided to supplement with some heat processed kidney beans and black turtle beans to my raw vegan diet, how do you make them in an instant pot on the lowest temperature? All right, so I don't personally focus on the lowest temperature when I'm in the instant pot. I focus on the shortest amount of cook time. You know, you'd have to research how to cook beans at a lower temperature. The issue is I want to have the temperature high enough to basically deactivate some of the, you know, toxins in the beans, the lectins and whatever else are in there. But I want to cook them for the shortest amount of time because I don't want to degrade nutrients and lose nutrients like 
phytochemicals needlessly. So what I do on, you know, things like the black beans and uh, black turtle beans and kidney beans is I would soak them, number one, like overnight, at least eight hours in water, maybe eight to 10 hours, eight to 12 hours. You want to soak them in water, and I, I like to do this under vacuum, so it literally forces the water in there. Um, this will help them to, quote unquote, sprout. Then you want to pour off the soak water, then you want to rinse them really well. Then you could put them in the instant pot. Of course, you want to add enough water to your instant pot because they'll basically just be covered in water because they'll still absorb more water during the cooking process. I forget the exact ratio. Maybe like, you know, for every pound of um, beans that are soaked, you might have to put like, I don't know, three cups. Don't quote me on that. And then you want to cook it on high. So basically to use the instant pot, it's very easy. I'm not the master magician on all of it. I basically press the manual button. It, mine defaults to 30, depending on what model you have. It may default to a different number. And then you're going to go down anywhere between 10 minutes. You could try 10 minutes. They might be a bit hard and firm when it's done, or up to 15 minutes. So you'll have to see how long the beans take for you after soaking the way you soak them. Could be as low as 10, might be up to 15, might be 12. You'll have to experiment once again. And then just put them in there for a 10-minute cycle. Let them cook for 10 minutes, take them out, let them cool, and then eat them. I mean, that's it. So basically, instant pot under steam pressure, you know, and 10 PSI will get the temperature up to about 248 degrees, which I recently aired a video talking about, you know, not all cooked food is poison or as bad as some raw vegans would lead you to believe. Link down below to that video. Next question is from The Hunt for Truth. Thanks for sharing your passion and knowledge. You change lives, but will you ever get a higher quality camera? All right, so right now I have a Sony ZV-1, and I'm, it could film in 4K, but I'm filming it at 1080 uh, currently. That's my upgraded camera, so when I'm at home, I use the upgraded camera, whether I'm filming inside juicer demonstrations or whether I'm filming in my garden. I use a Sony, which is a higher quality camera for sure. That being said, we've got to upload it and then download it and re-upload it to my video editor and stuff, so we may lose a little bit of quality in all the transfers. Um, I don't, I'm not at the point where I really want to, you know, start filming in 4K yet. I don't think it's totally required or necessary to see, you know, higher quality of whatever I'm filming because to me it's more about the information. Um, I am continually looking for an, a good travel camera um, that's like a camcorder style that has long battery packs and has unlimited record time um, and works, you know, without fail and is durable to be tossed around in my bags. And then I will be upgrading my travel camera as well. Next question is from uh, Helga4769. What do you think of cold pressed flax oil? Is it healthy? All right, so here's the thing like, healthy compared to what? All right? So, like, I'm not a big fan of bottled oils that you find in the grocery store, especially if they're not refrigerated. Flax oil should be refrigerated. Most of the time, you'll find flax oil in plastic bottles, which I don't think are a good thing. You can find brands such as Udo's, um, you know, flax oil that is in glass. I think those are definitely better. But here's the thing, like, why do you need to eat the flax oil? The, the goal for me would be to eat the whole flax seed and grind them up to get all the nutrients from the flax oil, right? When you're drinking the oil, yes, you may get the omega, you know, threes that you're looking for. You may get some lignins if they don't filter the oil that much. But, you know, there's a lot more components to flax seeds that are not in the oil that you get by just grind, simply grinding up your flax seeds. So that would be my recommendation to you. The next question is from Beet Lettuce Zucchini. How much money should I invest in my first garden? <laughs> so the answer is as much as you can afford. <laughs> and it depends on how much you want to grow, right? I mean, I think my first time I put in my front yard garden, I spent like $1,000 on the soil which, I mean, back then to me was a lot of money. I mean, it's still a lot of money. And it's kind of crazy to think I spent $1,000 on the soil. But yeah, over the years, I've spent a lot more money on soil because the soil keeps kind of going down a little bit. I keep having to refresh it. So, you know, here's the thing. Like, I think money invested in a garden is some of the best money you will ever spend simply because you're going to grow food and now you don't have to buy food. So, you know, you, like the plants here you see, like I'm growing these, Baylay trees, I could just pick the leaves off it all summer long until November, and I'm eating leafy greens. I don't have to buy lettuce. I mean, I, I'm growing a few lettuce plants still that are hanging on during the heat. 
but I don't grow lettuce in the summer, but I'm growing the bele, and I have other things like the basil. I mean, if you tried to buy Thai basil at the store, it's like $9 a pound, man. Or I'm growing, like, all kinds of different vegetables that literally money can't buy. Like, I mean, nobody is growing this in my city, I guarantee it. This is the cranberry hibiscus, nice red-purple leaves. So, I mean, I think that you should have a budget, of course, and stick within your budget, but try to invest as much as you can in your garden to grow more food because it will pay you back in the future. Um, just be smart about it. You could, you know, I've seen a lot of people waste money on, you know, starting their garden and you could do it more frugally than not. I probably have some videos on my gardening channel where I discuss this, how to get the best deals on soil and whatnot. So yeah, I mean, I wish you good luck. Next question is from Carlos and Res Corona 6788. Do you count calories? How can you manage weight loss? All right, Carlos, so here's the thing. I don't count my calories, right? My goal is to maintain my weight, of course. I guess during the pandemic, I definitely gained weight. Then my goal was to lose a little bit of weight. But I still didn't count my calories. What I did was simply this. I started eating, like, whole processed foods and, like, trying not to deviate and eat things like dried foods or freeze-dried foods that add additional significant amount of calories, right? So if you stick to eating whole foods, like, you can eat as much vegetables as you want. Vegetables on average are about 100 calories per pound. Our stomachs are not big enough to literally eat enough vegetables to basically gain weight. And actually, if you're eating only vegetables, I don't recommend that. I don't recommend eating only fruit either. But eating only vegetables, you're probably going to be under eating because you won't be able to fit enough calories because your stomach is just not that big. Now, if you eat fruits and vegetables, right, you can get enough calories from eating fruits and vegetables because... Uh, fruits in general are about three times more calorically dense, 300 calories per pound than 100 calories per pound with the vegetables. So by simply just sticking to fruits and vegetables and maybe eating small amounts of nuts and seeds, like an ounce or two a day, maybe if you're eating beans and grains and other things, whole food sources of beans and grains, not like processed breads and all these other things, right? It's easy to stick with eating lower calories. If you start eating oils, then you get screwed up because now one tablespoon of oil is like 120 calories, or you could eat 100, you know, one pound of greens. So if you just drink a little bit of oil, you sprinkle a little bit of olive oil on your salad, now you're eating more calories from oil than your greens, and that is a problem. So I encourage you guys to blend up vegetables and non-sweet fruits with a little bit of nuts, or even cooked beans, for example, to make a nice dressing to put over your salads instead of using oil. So how can you manage weight loss? So, I mean, when I manage weight loss, I just started eating, instead of eating dried fruits for dessert, like I would many times, especially during the pandemic when I had some emotional eating situations going on. You know, nowadays I just eat a, you know, sweet potato. I, I steam sweet potatoes and that's what I eat. And they fill me up so I don't have any more room and they're less calorically dense than the you know, same amount of you know, than dates and nuts I would eat otherwise, right? So you just have to move in the direction of eating more fruits and vegetables. I mean, that's my main message on my channel. Eat mostly fruits and vegetables in their raw state, right? Snacking on fresh fruits, drinking green juices, drinking green smoothies, right? Making some fruit sorbet instead of having ice cream because in the end, that's 100% fruit, 100 calories per pound. You can't eat a lot of ice cream made out of 100% fruit or aka sorbet. So that's what I'd recommend for you. All right, next question is from Jan John Santa 6649. I would like to know how you would make a high plant protein juice. Example, I currently make a juice using baby mixed greens, carrots with some wheatgrass, and then chew some chia, hemp seeds, and flax seeds. All right, John, so, so to make a high-protein juice, I'd recommend juicing your greens, trying to get as many greens into your juice as possible, and it minimize other things, such as the carrots. I mean, yeah, have more wheatgrass in there, but, you know, the brassica greens, especially the watercress, is super high in protein content, as well as other brassica leafy greens. So kale, collard greens, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, bok choy, broccoli, and cauliflower leaves, not the whole flower themselves that's normally sold, are really high in protein. You want to extend your protein in your juices even more than just the leafy greens. Then you want to add some powdered duckweed, also called lentine powder you could buy. It's 100% 
basically dried duckweed, which is one of the highest sources of plant-based protein on the planet. And of course, I would also encourage you guys to add in high protein powders instead of nuts and seeds, which yes, have some protein, but algae powders such as spirulina, chlorella, blue-green algae have a lot more protein than the nuts and seeds. And of course, they also have considerably less fat as well. So that's what I recommend. All right, next question is from Stephen Fraser, 4543. Olive oil, good or bad? All right. So it depends, right? Olive oil, good or bad? When I first started raw vegan diet, I ate some high quality olive oil, oil biryani olive oil that was made in California, fresh, fresh, not diluted with any kind of inferior oils when they are imported. I thought they were good. Then I kind of learned more about natural hygiene and then kind of like I got rid of all my oils and basically shunned them because they are a high calorie food with very little phytonutrients in there. Um, and I would eat olives instead, right? Um, and I could get some nutrients that way. That being said, more recently, I started reintroducing small amounts of olive oil, but it's not just any olive oil from the store. The olive oil I buy, I researched it, took at least a day or two, and I found the best, healthiest olive oil money can buy, the highest polyphenol olive oil that I could secure and buy easily, and it's $80 a bottle. So, you know, if $80 a bottle is nothing to you, then buy it, but here's the thing. If you buy a bottle that's $80 of olive oil, which is not, not a big bottle, right? You're not going to just dump it on everything because you're not going to use it willy-nilly because it's so expensive. And that's how you should use this high-quality olive oil that's super high in polyphenol. Some of the documented published studies show that the, it's a, you know, the polyphenols in the olive oil are likely for the olive oil health benefit in Mediterranean diets. And I just want to maximize the benefits of the olive oil. If it didn't have the polyphenols in there, I simply would not be eating it. I don't just willy-nilly go out and eat olive oil. If it's not the best olive oil with the highest polyphenol content, I'm not going to waste my time. I would rather eat olives. Now, yes, I will say there are other ways you can get polyphenols from olives, including, you know, making an olive leaf tea, getting kind of olive leaf extracts and tinctures, which will also have the polyphenols. But, you know, frankly, I like the flavor of a high-quality olive oil and a high-quality balsamic vinegar. Vinegar also have many health benefits. And my vinegar, my balsamic vinegar ain't cheap either. It's aged 12 years organic. That stuff's like $40 a bottle. So, like, between my olive oil and my vinegar, it's like 120 bucks just to add a little, little bit, right? And I do put more balsamic vinegar on my salad dressing than the oil because I try to keep that down to a tablespoon and I usually batch prep for like four quarts and I'm putting maybe a tablespoon or two because I don't want to like burn through my olive oil too fast because it costs too much money. <laughs> so that's what I would recommend if you guys want to eat olive oil. Get the super expensive, the best stuff if you guys want to buy that stuff or the high-end balsamic that I found which is the best one that I found so far, organic. Link down below Amazon.com slash shop slash John Kohler. I have all my special, crazy, weird food items and gadgets I use to make my diet possible listed in there. And of course, when you guys make a purchase at my Amazon store, Amazon shares with me a small commission so I can continue my Amazon habit of buying all these crazy things that probably most people don't need. <laughs> all right. So that's what I'm going to say. All right. Next questions from uh, Beet Lettuce Zucchini again. I just bought a jar vacuum sealer is passing four days too much. So I'm not really understanding the question. So did, I guess, are you vacuum sealing your jars and then it's four days old and you're saying, is it still good? So there's many factors. If you just vacuum seal the jar, left it on your counter for four days, I'm going to say it's not good. Vacuum sealing, while it will remove the air, it does nothing to preserve the food. Now, maybe if you're making a ferment on your counter and you vacuum seal it for four days, it's still good because it could be fermented for like a week or so. Um, that being said, if you guys are storing it properly in the fridge, I recommend storing vacuum sealed foods in the fridge kept cold. My vacuum sealed foods are kept at approximately 34 to 35 degrees, super cold, and I have no issues storing things like juices, pre-cooked foods or even salads for up to a week without any issue. Now the other caveat is I want you guys to use the best vacuum sealer. 
standard, you know, mason jar flat lids with a little adapter and a vacuum sealer going to the food saver. That to me is not adequate. I've tested a food saver. It only pumps down to about 10 inches of mercury. You know, I want to max out the amount of mercury or the amount of in inches of mercury I'm pulling because when you max out more inches of mercury, that means you're pulling out more oxygen, which means there'll be less oxygen to react to the food to make it go bad faster. You know, if you don't follow my exact tips, you're not going to extract the most oxygen and then it's up to you. It's not going to store seven days. I'm telling you and show you guys what I do. The way I store my stuff under vacuum stores seven days. And, you know, I use all these other tips and techniques. I may have to have a video on it one of these days. Um, so four days seems reasonable. I don't know the recipe that you're trying to vacuum store or how long or what, what it was made out of. You know, some things will go off, you know, differently. What I will say is a lot of the things that I vacuum store that I may not get to, maybe a small percentage, 1% goes bad. But most of the time, before they even go bad, they actually just ferment in the jar, whether I, it ferments my, my juice in a fermented juice or my fermented salad or soups in a fermented salad or soup. Um, so they tend to ferment before they go bad, so I rarely waste them. So I, I kind of like that. And then the other thing I'd recommend, once again, buy the vacuum pump that I recommend. It's the hand pump, not an electric pump. Electric pumps don't pump as much as a hand pump. And yes, a hand pump will work you out, and that's why I got some muscles here. It's because I'm hand pumping all my juices and mason jars, like 10 to 15 pumps every single one to make sure I evacuate all that extra oxygen so it does not degrade my food during storage. <laughs> all right. Link down below to my Amazon.com uh, slash shop slash John Kohler for my recommended storage appliances. And I recommend the special vacuum lids as well. They pull a stronger vacuum and are reusable, unlike flat lids that tend to lose their vacuum after about six, ten uses. All right. Last question is from a master of vital energy. Is Burger King and McDonald's good for you? All right. So the Burger King and McDonald's stores are great for me when I'm traveling and I have to go to the bathroom in the middle of nowhere and there's no other stores available. Other than that, I don't encourage anybody to eat McDonald's or Burger King foods. I mean, they're just highly processed. Yes, maybe sometimes they sell salads, but even then, you're just it's going to be too expensive. You don't know how it's processed. You don't know the quality of food. I'd recommend Go into a grocery store or better yet health food store and just buying greens and some guacamole dip or some hummus dip and just dumping the hummus or the guacamole on top of your greens and mixing it up. Maybe putting a little bit of kimchi on there and eat it. It's going to be significantly healthier, right? Go to the grocery store and buy some bananas. Even eating straight bananas that are raw and fresh out of the grocery store, even if not completely ripe, they'll probably be higher in resistance starch. Definitely healthier than McDonald's and Burger King. And if your name is Master of Vital Energy, hopefully this was a joke. All right. So that's pretty much it for this month's Q&A. If you guys enjoyed this month's Q&A, hey, please be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. More importantly, share this with others that you think it can help on a raw vegan diet or even plant-based diet so that they could hear from my 28 years of eating a raw vegan plant-based high nutrient diet that's minimally processed. Also, be sure to click that subscribe button right down below so you miss on my new and upcoming episodes of Command every five to seven days. You never know where I show up or what you'll be learning on my YouTube channel. And finally, be sure to click the little bell so you get notified as many videos come out. Finally, be sure to check my past episodes. Past episodes are a wealth of knowledge. Over 750 episodes at this time on this channel dedicated to you guys all about eating more plant foods and maximizing your consumption of raw fruits and vegetables, which are some of the healthiest foods on the entire planet. So with that, my name is John Kohler with OKRaw.com. We'll see you next time. And until then, remember, keep eating your fresh fruits and vegetables. They're always the best.